You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. This is The Art Ambassador with your host, Gwenda Joyce. A former gallery owner, Gwenda takes artists through a step-by-step process that moves them past frustration and into comfort, abundance, and creative flow. So now, please welcome the host of The Art Ambassador, Gwenda Joyce. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Art Ambassador Radio Show. I'm your host, Gwenda Joyce, and we're coming to you live on the BBM Global Network. The Art Ambassador Radio Show is a place where we bring art into the conversation. And today I have a really interesting show to you for you about museums. When we think of art museums, we often think of the venerable institutions of the past with stockpiles of cultural objects and artifacts. Even the contemporary art museums that exist today are well established, like MoMA in New York City, which is almost 90 years old. But new museums open every year, and many of them are the result of a large contribution either in art or a large financial contribution that is the result of one or two people's largesse and, of course, many people working behind the scenes. Today, I'm really pleased to be speaking with my guests who are representatives of two new museums who opened earlier this year in April, in fact. Uh, My first guest will be the curator, Emily Capus, of the James Museum of Western and Wildlife Art. And later in the show, we'll be joined by the director, the new director of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art, which is part of Washington State University in Pullman, Washington. Both are very unique institutions with a particular museum. As I mentioned, they both opened earlier this year in April. The James Museum, which is located in St. Petersburg, Florida, has its roots in the deeply felt passion for art and culture shared by co-founders Tom and Mary James. Their love for art took them to throughout the West, and they were captivated by the landscape and the art and the wildlife of the West many years ago. And they started to feel that they wanted to capture this uh, feeling of the West through the eyes of the contemporary artists because they were so moved by them. And they began buying pieces not only for their personal pleasure, but so that they could support the artists who were making this amazing artwork. These two dedicated patrons of the art collected works in oil and in ink and in stone and even collected jewelry. They have collected works that define genres and defy labels, works that evoke the spirit of the wide open frontier and the beauty of life in the wild. Since that vast artistic legacy has grown through their collection, we're starting to be inspired to turn this collection into the basis of a museum. And that museum opened, as I mentioned earlier this year. So I'm pleased to have Emily Capus, who is the curator of the museum, here with us today. Welcome, Emily. Welcome to the Art Ambassador Radio Show. Thank you for having me today, Gwenda. I appreciate it. Now, as curator of this exhibition, of this museum, you are in a different role than you have been in previously. So can you tell us a little bit about how you it came about that you got involved in uh, becoming the curator of this new museum? 
Uh, yes. So it is a unique situation. Uh, for the past dozen years prior to the museum opening, I was the uh, curator at the corporate offices of Raymond James Financial. Um, and, and the James of Raymond James Financial um, is, of course, um, related to the James family. Tom James um, was president for many years and, and is currently chairman emeritus of Raymond James Financial. And um, the art has always been housed at the firm. And so over the years, um, as the collection has grown, there's been art on every floor of every tower. And we currently have about a million two hundred thousand square feet of office space. So the in the collection is over three thousand works strong. And so my job was to manage that collection. Um, but in the last few years, um, as the museum project started to to really um, so the plans began to get firmed up, um, I became more and more dedicated to helping open the museum. And so when the art moved over a few months prior to the opening of the museum, um, I came with the art. So I was uh, I've never worked in a museum before. This is uh, the first time for this kind of environment. Um, but I, I've certainly brought a lot to the table as far as knowing about the art. Um, and uh, it's been an exciting experience to be here and really see the art in an elevated location um, with with you know current climates, climate settings and proper lighting um, and just a really elegant space. Um, it was an existing that, building that was it, was changed. Well, the Jameses also, having been collectors, uh, didn't have experience so much with starting a museum, um, except that I do understand Tom James was on the board of the Dolly Museum for many years, which is just down the street from the James Museum. Uh, but it, it, it uh, it's converting, it, it's taking this uh, probably as entrepreneurial energy of creating something new and bringing it into the museum. And now you have a, a new facility, a new building that was formerly a department store and has been transformed into a new space to house the collection. Uh, and that is yeah. a, a wonderful building. Tell us how that was designed and uh, and, and with the kinds of things um, that you really wanted to make sure were part of the museum. Yeah, so the the building that we're in was currently designed to be a department store. It, it never ended up opening as a department store, but had several different iterations with different um, businesses and, and offices. So when we first visited the space in January of 2015 um, to see if, if it was viable, um, it was just cubicles everywhere and it was very open and so um, the, the architect that we worked with Jan Weymouth um, said yes I can I can see potential in this um, the location was great there was available parking St. Petersburg is really growing and we, we knew that parking could possibly be a challenge and so we knew we needed that we wanted to be in a good walkable location we're, we're right downtown on Central Avenue um, and um, there's been a lot of growth in the last decade, and there's a great buzz, especially around arts and culture here in St. Pete. So we knew that we wanted to be in this location and, and that this specific building really worked for us. We knew that we needed a flexible space. We knew that um, it ended up being a slightly bigger space than what we had intended, um, but it kind of worked out that the museum um, is maybe two thirds of the space that was purchased. And then the rest of it has been leased out for retail offices and, and shops. So um, it, it worked out well there, but the total museum square footage is about 88,000 square feet uh, with about 30,000 square feet specifically for the gallery spaces. Um, it's on the first two floors of the building, and then there's a parking garage, uh, six stories of parking garage actually, above the museum. Um, so it's, it's parking is right on site. <laughs> uh, but it, it has worked well for us. And when we were looking at it, we knew we needed, um, of course, a secure structure, um, a, a safe structure for um, inclement weather. We are in the hurricane zone. And, um, we uh, we knew we needed um, a, a lot of the uh, the security options that were able to be added, and so um, we knew we were ready to go. So the process really started in 2015. 
and you did open earlier this spring. I'm so pleased to hear about what's going on at the James Museum of Western and Wildlife Art. And we're going to be talking more with Emily Capis, the curator, after we take a break. This is Gwenda Joyce. I'm the host of the Art Ambassador Radio Show, and I'm also the author of Nine Steps to Artistic Freedom, Living the Artist's Life and Making It Sustainable. We're going to have more conversation about art in just a few minutes. Stay with us. We'll be right back. French Rastafarian baker Chef Oug Mat is a fourth-generation baker and has worked in 11 countries across three continents. Born in Mulhouse, France, he began apprenticing in his father's bakery at age 12 and has devoted his life to learning cultures of the world from inside kitchens across the globe. He also teaches traditional French baking by hosting demonstrations and classes, and his passion for baking is reflected in his delicious confections. With a deep respect for discipline and his Rastafarian way of life, Chef Ouvmat exemplifies commitment to tradition and culture in a global world. Traveling extensively and combining a myriad of flavors into his recipes, Chef Ouvmat brings a unique approach to baking. To read more about the French Rastafarian baker, visit www.frenchchefoug.com. That's H-U-G-U-E-S. Bon appétit and bless up. Joseph A. Moylan is the owner of Ion Health, which specializes in very unique medical devices. Ion Health offers biomats, alkalife, and frequency machines. Biomats are a far infrared and negative ion emitting FDA approved medical device. With many different sizes available, you can place them on your bed, on a massage table, or on a seat in your car. It is an unobtrusive way to health. Alkalife machines are water ionizers that cleanse and raise the alkalinity of your tap water, making high alkaline water. Frequency machines utilize certain frequencies to kill viruses and bacteria. These devices are safe and effective. Coming from a health-conscious background and studying physiology at the Academy of Natural Health, Joseph A. Moylan has 15 years of experience in the health field and wants to help you live a healthy, long life. Visit www.ionhealthbiomats.weebly.com or call 765-520-2988. Don't let your health go astray. Get in touch today. Welcome back to the Art Ambassador Radio Show on BBM Global Network. I'm your host, Gwenda Joyce, and I'm here with Emily Capis of the James Museum of Western and Wildlife Art. And this new museum is located in St. Petersburg, Florida. And Emily, I think probably the first question that we might have about the museum in St. Petersburg is, how does a a wildlife and Western art collection um, show itself and become of interest to people in St. Petersburg, Florida, which is quite far geographically uh, from the West. So how has that collection and (laughs) direction shown up in the museum? I would imagine it makes Um, it more challenging for you. You know, I think initially it is more challenging. It it is unusual. And when people hear a Western art museum in Florida, you know, they are taken aback sometimes. Uh, But I think once people enter in, they are truly, um, there's a feeling of of being transported to the West uh, with the architecture, with the stone, um, and and with the stories that um, are in the paintings. So I think it's a great educational opportunity. We've had so many school groups come through already, um, and so many people haven't been able to to travel to the West, and so it really kind of brings it here. Um, And there's a lot of Native American culture and history discussed. Um, this, it's a lot of um, frontier stories. Uh, it's a lot of animals in the painting. So the kids really love that. Um, I think, and, and there's so many styles represented too. It's not just photorealistic or, or really traditional or detailed, um, although that there is that. Um, we've got so many modern West painters um, that are stylized and almost to the point of abstraction. And um, there's really something for everybody. So as soon as they set foot in the door, I think we, we, they get, they understand, you know? 
I think that's great. As someone who was born and raised in the West, I do feel that there are certain ca- characteristics of of life that we get to be comfortable with here that uh, people don't realize when they live in a different part of the country or the world. And so transporting, creating this kind of environment and putting it somewhere else uh, I'm sure it just has a lot of value and fascination for the people in St. Petersburg. So my next question that I'm curious about, Emily, is the collection itself and how it is presented to uh, in the museum to make it easier to understand. I understand that you have thematic uh, uh, divisions within the collection and you are uh, – putting the different categories of art in different exhibition spaces. Is, is that sort of the basic structure? Yes. Um, yes. And then so it, we have eight major galleries. Oh, go ahead. Well, that's exactly what I wanted to know about. You have the themes, themed galleries, and what are those? Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the very first gallery that you enter is our Early West Gallery. So these are paintings from... Um, early Western art. It's not the earliest, of course, but uh, because it is a very contemporary collection, most of the artists are living and, and current working artists. But this is a small sample of some of the, of the early Western artists that influence everyone else in the museum. So chronologically, it starts, that, it starts that way. The rest of the museum, though, is themed really more by subjects. And so we've got Native American subjects um, in the Native Life Gallery. We've got a dedicated uh, gallery for Native artists' work. Um, and that does include the jewel box, which is a, a special feature of Native American jewelry, just some of the top in the world, um, really amazing designs and materials there. Um, we've got a frontier gallery. Gallery. Um, we've got a wildlife gallery. So it's stories of, um, of westward expansion, of um, outlaws, of, of cowboys. And so those are really fun. And then we've got a modern west gallery and, um, and a rotating space, too. So we, um, we really do have a lot, of, um, a lot of variety as you walk through the galleries. It's kind of like you, um, there's a uh, uh, you kind of walk through in a kind of a counterclockwise circle. And so you can really kind of experience everything. And we have available highlight tours to really showcase some of the favorite uh, objects. And I'm sure that the myth and the reality of the West is one of the things that you're dealing with in terms of presentation, because the West has this myth of, you know, cowboys and Indians and, and, uh, you know, the, the things from the past that maybe aren't really true, but they've become larger than life. And I imagine that you're, uh, in the artwork that you're presenting, you're actually showing more of what it really is like and was like for people to live in the West. In many cases, the, the paintings and the artifacts were, uh, you know, in times before television and video and photography even, uh, they were the ways that history was recorded. Uh, do you feel that that's an important part of your legacy in, in terms of presentation in the museum? Um, well, it, it is. And it, um, a lot of the paintings are certainly based on, on history, on journals, um, you know, possibly on some early photos. But the, the artists really do their best to um, uh, to really show pieces of history, but just remember it is their interpretation. So it, it, there are there is a little bit of artistic license sometimes, um, but it's certainly based on history, and it, they are great catapults for for learning opportunities. So our tours um, really do kind of dig into some of the the stories, and it's kind of a jumping off point for great conversations about the West, um, and especially when it comes to school groups. Um, you know, there's so much that's just abbreviated in, in histories and, and, and um, for the schools. And so it's nice to dig in a little more to it. Um, I have uh, twin boys that are seven. And when I brought them in um, one of their first times, we have some, um, some replicas of, of wagons and stagecoaches. And they weren't sure what they were. They didn't know what to call them. Um, and so it's oh, interesting that there's this... 
this generational, uh, there's a gap, you know, they don't, they don't necessarily know about that. They don't necessarily know cowboy history. And so it's so fun to show them in pictures and in paintings and bronzes, some of these action scenes, and it really gets them interested. Well, absolutely. It's a real hands-on way of, of experiencing the past and the way, different ways that people live. Is there a particular painting that you have that's a favorite that you think really shows the spirit uh, of the, the West and the collection in the museum? Um, gosh, I have several favorites. And, um, and I will say that the, the, we are... Um, uh, experiencing sometimes new things that come in. And so a lot of times um, what it is, what is uh, kind of new to, uh, to bring in, but we have some great paintings by John Nieto that are, that are recent acquisitions um, that, that are um, Native American portraits um, in our new West gallery. And they're, they're, they're fun because they have bold color and, and big blocks of color. And um, they really um, draw you in. They're very compelling in the way that he's painted them. Um, and so it, um, I think it's, uh, it's been great to see people's reaction to those because they're kind of modern twists on traditional portraits. And um, it, it's, a, it's fun to talk to so many artists that are living and working and that can do demonstrations and that can do talks so that we, we have this opportunity to bring them in as part of programming. And so we, we do plan to do that. Um, so we know a lot about the art um, because the artists sometimes are, are here. Well, we are talking with Emily Capus, who is the curator of the James Museum of Western and Wildlife Art, a brand new museum that opened this spring. We're going to be finding out about more about their current programming uh, if as we take a break, after we take a break, we'll be right back. This is Gwenda Joyce, the host of the Art Ambassador Radio Show. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Psychologist, master certified coach, and CEO of the executive and organizational development firm True North Leadership, Dr. Relly Nadler brings his expertise in emotional intelligence to keynotes, consulting, coaching, and training. He is the author of Leader's Playbook and Leading with Emotional Intelligence that lays out tips and tools for effective leadership. Dr. Nadler has designed multi day executive boot camps for high achievers in Fortune 500 companies and has coached CEOs, presidents, and their staff and developed and delivered innovative leadership programs for such organizations as Anheuser-Busch, BMW, MCI, EDS, DreamWorks Animation, the U.S. Navy, and Vanguard Health Systems. To learn more and get your free iPhone app highlighting his tools with videos, leadership keys, visit www.truenorthleadership.com today. Certified professional coach Pamela Reeves can help you with your relationships. Motivational and image coaching are just some of the ways she can help you enhance all aspects of your life. Her book, Is It Love or Merely a Sick Attachment?, helps readers clearly distinguish healthy, loving relationships from toxic ones. Ms. Reeves has put her words into action through Ray of Hope Kenya, an international initiative that provides outreach to victims of abusive relationships there with the goal of helping them rebuild their lives and the tools to avoid abuse. Ms. Reeves operates various business interest through her umbrella network, Nella LLC, and credits her success to her diverse work experience. Whatever your goals, whether striking a balance, reinventing your image, or simply lifting your lifestyle, Pamela Reeves will help you achieve them. Your life, your call. Dial 410-902-5715 or email Pamela at pamreg01 at verizon.net. She's also on the web at pamreeves.com and on Twitter at Pamela underscore Reeves. Welcome back. This is Gwenda Joyce. I'm the host of the Art Ambassador Radio Show. We are talking about new museums today, and I am pleased to have my guest, Emily Capus, of the James Museum of Western and Wildlife Art here. And this museum is fascinating because it's built on the very extensive collection of the owners uh, and founders, Tom and Mary James. But it, in turning the museum into a museum, excuse me, in turning the collection into a museum, uh, the emphasis has become uh, a little bit different. And I'm very much interested, Emily, in hearing about the current exhibition of work by James Michael that is on view at the museum right now. 
please tell us about that and how how it's different from the collection. Well, James Michaels is a celebrated artist here in the Tampa Bay region. Uh, He's had a career more than 40 years here. And um, Tom and Mary James started collecting his work in the mid-1980s. And um, painting after painting um, uh, came into their collection. And um, they ended up with 95 of them. (laughs) So uh, we knew that um, when the museum was was being planned, that we just had to do a show with James Michael's work. Um, His work really pulls from childhood memories and um, pop culture references, art history, um, masterpieces. He pulls in details from recognizable paintings um, from the Renaissance and Baroque periods. He... um, puts in a lot of self-portraits in his work. It's, it's clever, it's creative, and he's technically very talented. But these pop references uh, are something that it, they're, they're instantly recognizable and people really relate to it. And he puts them, them together in creative montages. So we knew we, we wanted to have this rotating gallery that wouldn't just be Western and wildlife art. We wanted to bring in the variety. We wanted to bring in the community. We wanted to bring in people that wouldn't necessarily just walk into a Western art museum. Um, and this kind of show, I think, will pull people in. It opens this Saturday and runs through March 3rd. And we're really excited to um, to showcase his work and really celebrate him as an artist. He's in his 70s now. Um, there's about 35 paintings on display, and they're, they're large. Some of them are, are six and eight feet tall um and it's just really a bold fun show well this sounds really uh, exciting and very current i know that people of all ages will enjoy it and you do a lot of outreach to bring people to the museum i wish you all the best it's been a pleasure having you on the show today emily and uh I can't wait to visit the James Museum myself in St. Petersburg, and I encourage the audience to make it a destination. Uh, thank you again for oh, joining thank you us. Thank for having me. I'm going to now uh, speak to my next guest, who is the director mm-hmm. of a museum in a completely different part of the country, actually in the West, in the state of Washington, uh, but the orientation of the museum is quite different. And I'd like to, at this time, welcome Robin Held, the director of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art in which is part of Washington State University in Pullman, Washington. Robin, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be with you today. So, Robin, you are a new director. You've only been at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art for uh, three months, and you have an exciting future ahead of you. But the and the museum itself was kind of recreated, and a new building opened in April of this year. Uh, tell us about the background of the museum building. It just it's, it's and the reason that it's on the campus at the Washington State University in Pullman. Well, let me back up a little bit to say that uh, Washington State University is a land grant university which means that at the turn of the 20th century, it was part of a big movement to bring education to where people were and the arts and the sciences um, and the human experience were central to that mission. So the university has been there for many, many years and it was one of the earliest land grant universities in the United States. The museum, it has had an art museum since the 1960s, and it was tucked in to a fine arts building and has, has created many exhibitions over time, has a long, illustrious history within, a, the, within the university. And it's been a long-term vision of former directors, funders, uh, alums, to create a state-of-the-art facility in the center of campus to showcase the fine arts as a center of creativity and innovation and new ideas 
on a research university campus. So um, the building, so this, this has been a long time in the making, and the building opened in April. It is a beautiful, architecturally significant building by architects Olsen Kundig. I was lucky enough to have worked for a long time at Olsen Kundig's very first museum, which is a fry art museum in Seattle. They make beautiful, very clear buildings. Um, the building was a public safety building. So it was the site of law enforcement and uh, fire, the fire department on campus. And it was repurposed. Um, it's right across the way from the student union and from the stadium. So it is really a beacon in the center of campus. And that's our first site, but we'll, we'll talk about that one. Well, we'll take a break, and we're going to find out more about the museum and, and how it's important for all, students of all kinds who are interested in all different topics to come to the museum and enjoy the programming. So stay with us. We're going to take a break. This is Gwenda Joyce. I'm the host of the Art Ambassador Radio Show, where we bring art into the conversation. We'll be right back. America is out of control. Today's capitalism and the approach to money is in fact a symptom of a more widespread pattern of excessive behavior. In his book, The Culture of Excess, How America Lost Self-Control and Why We Need to Redefine Success, clinical psychologist Dr. Jay Slosar portrays an America where excess fuels the drive to succeed. Dr. Slosar examines the cultural factors that lead to excess ranging from obesity to fraud to pervasive budget deficits. His book examines the powerful economic and social factors and their impact on our psychological well-being. Dr. Slosar explores the psychological impact of increasing narcissism, perfectionism, self-destruction, and our identity confusion. He offers recommendations for helping Generation Me become Generation We. Those who resist Slosar's message will want to avoid his discussion of regulation and his recent message that at this point, democracy must be more important than today's capitalism. Get his book now online or by visiting thecultureofexcess.com. Attorney Renee Marie Smith is changing the way we sell real estate. She wrote a series of books called My Short Sale Guru Guides for all real estate practitioners. Whether you're a homeowner wanting to understand the process, an agent who has been handling short sales for years, or an industry analyst wanting to know how short sales impact your business, Renee uses her vast real estate experience to take a comprehensive look at the recent market phenomena while relaying it in an easy-to-understand format. Through her company, Smith Title Services, Renee has counseled thousands of of short sale participants and processed in excess of a thousand short sales. Her knowledge is transformational for real estate professionals and laymen alike, and her live presentations provide people the opportunity to ask specific questions about their issues. Buy her books and schedule her to speak at your next event. Visit www.smithtitleservices.com or call 305 705 3428 or email her at renee at smithtitleservices.com. Isn't it time to sell your property today? Learn the My Short Sale Guru way. Welcome back. This is Glenda Joyce, and I'm the host of the Art Ambassador Radio Show coming to you on BBM Global Network. I'm here today speaking with Robin Held, who is the new director of Repurposed and Reimagined Museum in the center of the campus at Washington State University in Pullman, Washington. And this uni university museum has uh, a wonderful mandate. And Robin, tell us about how the Students are encouraged and actually guided and directed to come to the museum and enjoy the mm. cultural offerings. Thank you for that opportunity to talk about this. Currently, the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at WSU is the only dedicated, freestanding, fine art museum between Seattle and Missoula, which is an extraordinary distance. It's also such an open opportunity for influence uh, across an entire, across the entire Northwest. Um, there's a baseline that uh, at, on campus that, um, that every single student visits the museum. So every single prospective student and their parents, every incoming student, everyone visits the museum. Now that's just an introduction. The relationships that we build, they will be, they will be, that'll be the work to do so that there's 
that we reach every student on campus for a rich, transformative experience during their campus life and beyond. And there is currently the one museum uh, on campus, there, um, this, this new state-of-the-art facility. And we are now in the original museum site. We are creating a collection and learning center. The collection and learning center will be the mm -hmm. academic nexus of the museum. And it's where students, researchers, faculty will all have greater access to the works of art in the collection for their own research purposes, for study, for, for learning together. Well, this is such a wonderful opportunity and premise. I feel that many people are, are just not familiar with walking into a museum and to have the encouragement and have it be part of the program is probably making a, a very significant difference to people who are not used to going to museums and maybe are a little bit intimidated by them. Do you feel that you're reaching out to that kind of audience? Well, this is the opportunity here. I cannot assume that each person walking in the door, I, I think I'm, I, I must start from the place that it may, it may be their very first museum experience. It may even be what they think of as their first art experience, even if there's lots of art making in their home. Um, uh, and so there's not a shared vocabulary. They're not shared habits. So we will be creating habits and introducing people to, to art on campus, part, art as part of their everyday experience of campus. The museum is free. We will be showing works from the collection. We'll be exhibiting artwork from around the world. And we will be showing the kind of, the kind of art that would have great impact on your first experience of art. Personally, if, if we are successful, I think the engagement of students in the museum at WSU, it will make them, as they go out into the world, ha have higher expectations of what museums can be in our lives. Well, because I think that's the museum certainly will be true. So central. I think it will be also something that people will be uh, maybe seeking out on their own. Now, you ha you're you located in an area of west eastern Washington that's called the Palouse. It's a geographically yes. beautiful area. And are you making any efforts to in the museum to connect to both the land uh, of the that area, the Palouse, and also maybe the community of people who are living and working there? It's it's largely in our agricultural area, and there are other industries. How are you hoping to connect and make connections that are going to uh, enhance people's lives and experience of the museum and the art that is shown there? Well, I'll start with the new building itself. Um, the museum opened in April, and it was the most well-attended building opening in the history of campus. 3,000 people came to the opening, and the combination of students, 250 students or more a day, and community members, and K through 12 students who come through something called Buy a Bus program, we expect by the end of the year to have 15,000 visitors. And I, I estimate that next year we'll have 30,000. This is such a cultural hub, and there has been such desire for something, for something to do that is not eating and drinking in town, but some place that families can come and do something together. Um, the, we talked about two sites. There's the new museum, and then there is what will be the collection and learning center. Uh, there will also soon, this is just in the development phase, a downtown site, an experimental site that is part of the vision of um, WSU President Kirk Schultz to bring campus and community together. And that site 
will be located in downtown Pullman. And the kind of programming we do there will be driven by the question, what can we do together that we can't do separately? So it will provide new ways of gathering, new ways of creating together, and it will be another portal for a very different kind of visitor experience than the other two locations. That's a really wonderful uh, way to think about a an art space is to think about what we can do together rather than separately. Uh, this world is filled with a sense of isolation on all parts, and art has that ability to bring people together, people from different walks of life, uh, people who aren't used to being together because they don't know that they have the same interests. Art can really tackle that problem and solve that problem, and it does so on a subliminal way. Uh, it's such a pleasure to talk with you, Robin, about your museum. Uh, we're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back and find out more about what the museum has to offer for the people of Pullman, Washington, the community, and the world at large. This is Gwenda Joyce. I'm the host of the Radio Art Ambassador Radio Show. Uh, we'll be right back. Stay with us. For over 50 years, Evelyn Stapula has been a loving advocate for people with disabilities throughout the state of Pennsylvania. President and founder of Big Heart Bridges, her organization actively campaigns for legislation and support of civil liberties that meet the needs of disabled individuals with housing, transportation, and employment. Ms. Dupula has joined forces with a variety of esteemed organizations that advocate for the disabled. She serves on the board of the United Cerebral Palsy of Pittsburgh and the Governor's Cabinet and Advisory Committee for People with Disabilities, and she is a consultant for the Pennsylvania Governor's Conference for Women. Her many efforts have led to the implementation of a transportation program for the disabled with the Access Paratransit System of Allegheny County. Evelyn Stapoulis drives daily to serve the interests of the disabled, to protect their freedoms, and enable them to live normal public lifestyles. To learn more, please call 412-491-2605 or email Evelyn at ers92645 at verizon.net. Do you battle with weight loss? There is a solution. Founder of Weight No More Consulting, Deborah Simons, can help you lose weight safely and effectively through weight loss surgery. I know. I had the surgery two years ago, and I am 135 pounds lighter and medication-free. This full-service weight loss center caters to your every need as you navigate to a healthy weight following surgery. Servicing all of Canada, Weight No More Consulting takes pride in its compassionate care and guides you through each step before and after surgery. Starting with informational meetings, Weight No More Consulting educates each potential client before they decide to have surgery on the health risks of obesity and the various weight loss surgeries available. After surgery, Weight No More Consulting provides a solid support system with ongoing meetings to ensure continued success. Deborah Simons and Weight No More Consulting are committed to promoting your health and wellness through maintaining a healthy weight for life. We are back. This is Gwenda Joyce. I'm the host of the Art Ambassador Radio Show. And I'm pleased to be talking about two new museums that started just this year. Uh, the museum, the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at WSU in Pullman, is one that opened in April. And Robin Held, the director, uh, is here. And I'm Really ha and curious to know, Robin, about some of the actual artworks that you have on view or plan to have on view at the museum. Um, you have some commissions in the works. Please tell us what, what those are about. So one of the things that uh, I've been really thrilled about at the museum, in these new spaces, as students get used to these new spaces, there were artworks that were created specifically for the acoustics, for the architecture, for the experience of a visitor. And they are, they appeal to all of our senses. So I'll give you two examples. When the museum opened and, can, and still on view is a large sound sculpture by a, a world-renowned artist named Trimpen, who was born in the Black Forest in Germany. He has worked lived and worked in Seattle um, for an international audience for more than 40 years. And he created what are basically large reed instruments 
that are activated by your body as you go by. And the composition he has created is set at the frequency of 432 megahertz. And if you know that frequency, it is what you, its parallel is the sound of Tibetan singing bowls. And it's said to be the sound of the universe. And it is Verdi's A. When you walk in and your body activates these works, you feel it fall through your body. And the pleasure for me has been in seeing students bring their friends back, bring their parents back, and come again and again and linger in these spaces. The second work I'll name is no longer on view, but it is by a sculptor named Marie Watt, who works in the Northwest. And it was, it's an enormous carved cedar she-wolf. When you walk in and you are met by this she-wolf, you smell the cedar. This, actually, this, the exhibition came down two months ago, and still that fantastic smell of cedar lingers in the galleries. So those are, those are two examples of art. If you ever thought that going into a museum was just for your eyes, I think this museum will change your mind. Well, I love that sense of inclusiveness and the sensual experience that the art that you're showing will bring to all the viewers. And I'm also inspired by the words of Jordan Schnitzer, who is uh, uh, who you'll tell us more about how his influence is uh, showing up in your museum. But he said, he's known to have said, for me, waking up each day without art around me would be like waking up without the sun. When you live with art around you, your mind and soul are filled with the beauty of life and the creativity of the human spirit. How is Jordan Schnitzer uh, influencing your museum? Well, so the Schnitzer family is um, a very influential uh, family uh, based in Portland, Oregon, who have contributed greatly to uh, the arts and education and health in the Northwest. And that statement from Jordan Schnitzer is Jordan. That's that's his passion, his reason for getting up in the morning. And he has turned that passion into an investment in University Art Museum. Pullman is the second. uh, With the mission of touching all lives all lives on campus, aspiring to bring art into everyone's life. So uh, the Family Foundation and Jordan Schnitzer um, made a large financial investment in, uh, in, the univers- in um, Washington State University and in the lives of students there and makes available to the museum this large uh, collection of art that is is located in Portland, Oregon. If you went to the Schnitzer Foundation website, you will see exhibitions uh, across the United States that come from that collection. But the connection with the museum then is the ability to show regularly, show art from that vast collection um, to the students at each of the universities. And that's such a wonderful uh, contribution and legacy, and it is uh, not only contributing to your particular museum, but all the entire system of museums that uh, w- WSU is part of. And, and to, if you could just briefly touch on that system, uh, mm-hmm. tell us a little about so that. This is, this is the potential. There are currently two Jordan Schnitzer Museums of Art. One is in Eugene, Oregon. One is in Pullman, Washington. There's a third plan for Portland, Oregon. There is another in in the ideation stage. Washington State University is also a system. Washington State University has campuses in Pullman, Spokane, Tri-Cities, Everett, and Vancouver, Washington. So if you take that that system, if you map these two systems and the potential we have to increase exponentially art access across the entire Pacific Northwest, this, this is the North Star. This is the North Star that begins 
in Pullman. Well, it's very exciting to know about the system that WSU has created and is a part of. And as a reminder that art is not only specific and local, but it is universal. And we're all connected to the joy and the um, pleasure that an association with art brings. Uh, I think there's a basic need and an interest for people to have art in their lives. Uh, Robin, thank you so much for joining me today on the Art Ambassador Radio Show. I encourage those of you who are listening to uh, make Pullman, Washington a destination and, and visit the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art and see the wonderful commissions and programming that are there. This is Gwenda Joyce. I'm the host of the Art Ambassador Radio Show, and we've been bringing art into the conversation today. I'm just delighted that we have a chance to talk about these museums. Stay with us. We'll be right back after a short break. Do you ever wonder why certain things are happening in your life? How to start a business or a new direction? Need answers? Astrologer Bonnie Perbula can help you reveal your true self and gain strength and focus so you can achieve greater joy and success. Working with a natal birth date, time, and location, Bonnie brings out qualities to aid you in getting the best from your life. She can help you unlock dormant traits to bring you greater awareness. Bonnie also conducts public speaking engagements to educate aspiring astrologers on their journey to the stars. A gifted artist, Bonnie bridges her talents and recently launched a line of Astro Bears, uniquely created in colors of individuals' astrology charts. She also makes one-of-a-kind necklaces of crystal beads and woven thread. To learn more about the world of Bonnie Prabula, go to BonnieGPrabula.com. And for astrology consulting, visit AstrologyConsultants.com or call or email her at 808-526-1536 or BonnieGP at AOL.com. Animal lover, author, artist, and public speaker, Patricia Daly Leip is a Renaissance woman in her own right. A lover of animals from a young age, Patricia lives on a farm in Virginia and has rescued neglected thoroughbred horses, keeping them or finding them safe havens. She is also a published author, and her books document real-life experiences that she shares in her passionate stories, taking the reader around the world in a colorful kaleidoscope of life. An accomplished artist, Patricia Daly Leip's oil paintings feature animals, portraits, stills, nature, and abstract, and she allows the brush to paint the image in an organic, natural way. A public speaker, Patricia is motivated to continually wonder about life and advocates for all of us to do the same and document our own unique history. To learn more about Patricia Daly Life, visit www.literarylady.com and www.patricialife.com or email her at pdlife at gmail.com. We are back. Welcome back to the Art Ambassador Radio Show. I'm your host, Gwenda Joyce, and we're no, we're on the BBM Global Network. And as Gwenda Joyce, I am also known as the Art Ambassador. I'm the author of a book called Nine Steps to Artistic Freedom, Living the Artist Life and Making It Sustainable. And that is available on my website at artambassador.net. The generosity and passion of collectors and benefits who share their passion for art has been the topic of our show today, and we have been talking about Tom and Mary James, whose collection has become the basis for the James Museum of Western and Wildlife Art in St. Petersburg, Florida. And we've been talking with Robin Held, who's the director of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum at WSU in Pullman, Washington. And Jordan Schnitzer is also a major collector and benefactor who has contributed so much art and so many financial means to support the arts in establishing and developing institutions. Now, these institutions uh, and museums are, are really working hard to create a stellar visitor experience for those of us when we visit. So... I encourage you to cross over your state lines and make these museums a destination because they're exciting places for all art lovers lovers to be engaged with them. So keep them on your radar and make a point to visit. These institutions exist for your pleasure. In the meantime, 
If you're not going as far, check with your local arts institutions and take part in their programming. More and more museums are seeking ways to involve their communities, and that means you, if you're an artist or an art lover. If you're an art lover, you can join me on one of my art tours as we visit artists and arts organizations in cities and communities around the world. Please register at artambassadortours.com, and if you're on my list, you'll be the first to receive notice of the art tours as they come about. If you're an artist, do you have dreams of showing your art to more people? Many of these arts art museums are interested in you, but oftentimes they may not know about your work, and they may not know that there are connections that can be made. I am passionate about bringing art to the world. I help a lot of artists break that barrier between themselves and the larger world. It brings me great joy to help artists to succeed and get their their art out into the world in a bigger way. And I've been helping many artists to do that over the years. Just last week, I scheduled a show for two of my artists at a local museum. The art world is my beat, and I can help you in making connections as your agent. Right now, I'm preparing to go to Miami for Miami Art Week, where the art world converges for a nonstop art extravaganza in early December. If you'd like to enlist my help, I encourage you to reach out to me through the website at artambassador.net. It starts by applying to have a conversation with me getting to know each other, and taking it from there. I promise you'll get a ton of value from it, and I look forward to talking with you about your specific challenges. Again, to request your conversation with me to get your art out there, go to artambassador.net. I'll let you know within 24 hours if your application is approved and we can set up a time to talk. I look forward to connecting with you. I'm so glad you joined me and my guest today on the Art Ambassador Radio Show. This is Gwenda Joyce, host of the Art Ambassador Radio Show. We'll see you next time. This has been the Art Ambassador with your host, Gwenda Joyce. If you're stuck in a creative world with little to no meaningful exposure and are looking to blend creative with the entrepreneurial spirit, listen each week for enlightening options and answers on Gwenda Joyce's The Art Ambassador. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.